Today I'm meeting with a very special person in the great outdoors adventures. No other than polar world record holder and outdoors expert, Ben Solders. I've been invited to join him at a stunning apartment block overlooking the famous Hammersmith Walk Bridge. Now this bridge is actually over 133 years old. It's used by pedestrians, cyclists and river traffic daily. So we decided to take our chat to the large balcony and discuss Ben's amazing experiences and expertise in outdoor exploration. Who you are and what you do right now? Wow, okay. Uh, so my name's Ben Saunders. Uh, who, what do I do right now? That's a really good question. Uh, well, I spent the last 20 years um, leading expeditions in, in the coldest places on the planet. So either the, the Arctic, North Pole, Greenland, uh, or Antarctica. So I've done 12 big expeditions since 2001. So my first was when I was 23. I never imagined it was going to become a career. I just, I, just, I thought that trip back then was like a one-off opportunity of a lifetime. I never imagined there'd be more of them. So yeah, I, I normally get introduced as a as a polar explorer, which is a pretty weird job title. And it's <laughs> it's not like my careers advisor at school never ever mentioned that as a as an option. Um, and of course, th- there are there are only two poles to explore. They were both found a long long time ago. So I haven't discovered any new poles I'm not really I, c- I can't really claim to be an explorer in the old-fashioned like Edwardian sense of the word because I've, I've never I've never drawn a map or like named a mountain or a glacier or anything but yeah I've been very lucky so I spent 20 years um, doing these these long journeys on foot in the in the polar region thank you for sharing that and that sounds amazing in fact like I didn't even know that either until I met you in fact I, when I did meet you as well and I and I heard your story in that sense and you're speaking about Shackleton and I was like wow like and and the thing for me that stood out as well was that you was like they died and I was like <laughs> I was like oh my days this guy's doing something crazy like he's like when you said oh they died on there they didn't make it back and yeah. I was like oh my days like wow like <laughs> This is crazy, what's going on? This guy must be like, and you was saying your story like, I'm a record breaker and mm. just that type of, and I was like, wow, like this is, a, I didn't even know this type of stuff exists, especially like my humble beginnings and how I even got into outdoors and stuff. I was so amazed by you and I was like, wow, like, I, I, and I was speaking next to you and I was like, I can't even believe that I'm sharing a like, kind of stage with this guy that other people are dying oh. doing what he's trying to do and I'm like, wow. But like, yeah, it's, it's a, yeah. I mean, in some ways, maybe it's a bit safer these days. But it's still, there's still been a lot of risk on these expeditions. But I, I think sometimes people might. I've, I've always struggled for like how to explain what I do or what my job title should be. And I'm, I'm sort of envious of friends. Like I've got some friends who are climbers or mountaineers, and they're like, oh, I'm a mountaineer. Mm. But if you do polar expeditions, there isn't really a. Like explorer sounds really grand. It's it always to me. It always felt like being in the army and saying you're a warrior, mm. or you know, just and like adventurer is not quite right because that makes it sound like I don't know. I sort of jump off cliffs with a wingsuit on and a GoPro <laughs> in my head, and I'm like, I'm like sort of adrenaline junkie. And there's not there's not much adrenaline on these expeditions. They're like long, slow walks in in really you know blank, deserted, very cold places. So yeah, they're more. In a weird way, for years, I, I always saw myself as a as a weird sort of athlete, mm. and that was that was what fascinated me, like the, the sort of the, the limits of human endurance in these places, like it, it, the, these long polar journeys on foot. To me, seemed like one of the toughest things you could attempt, like mm. as as a as a weird kind of endurance athlete. So that was that was a big part of the appeal, I think. So what would you say some of the challenges were whilst being on some of your expeditions? Oh man, well one of the biggest challenges looking back is that these are really expensive camping trips. Mm. And and I, I sound quite posh, but I'm really like my, my dad, my biological father was a bricklayer. He was an orphan, he had no education, so there was no, there was never any like family money or anything. So I had mm. to figure out how to find the money to pay for these big adventures. and. Um, 
and because they're they're so remote, either like very high Arctic or Antarctica, it's super expensive and and super complicated to get out there. And then you need all the equipment, and it's all quite specialised. Like you can't sort of walk into a shop in London and say, "Oh, I need a sledge to drag, <laughs> drag 200 kilos for four months in Antarctica," because mm. like that's crazy. Like nobody does that. So you have to figure out where to get the equipment made, like get stuff modified, stuff you know customised, made from scratch. You figure out all the food. You've got to have like a support team in the background for mm. for everything from communications and like updating sponsors and the press and charities and to um, like safety stuff like search and rescue and if anything goes wrong you need a support team so they're really really expensive and um, one of the biggest challenges has been ha figuring out how to raise the money for these things and yeah. it's all, all been from sponsorship from from getting companies to to um, to you know to fund them but my first my first ever meeting with a sponsor I think I was 20 or 21 and it was basically my mum's boss I think he just like took pity on me and, and, and invited me in for this meeting. And I printed out this, I'd made this little proposal document and printed it out and, um, and I had a map of where I was, I was wanted to go to the North Pole from Russia. And I was going with this guy called Penn, Penn with a P, Penn Haddo, who was, he was like my kind of mentor really. So that first trip, which happened in 2001, I was 23, was like my apprenticeship. And um, it didn't, we didn't get to the North Pole, but I learned a lot. Anyway, this first meeting with sponsor, he invited me in and all of my, like all of the people I looked up to, if I'd seen them, I don't know, in, in, in newspapers or on the internet or in books or magazines like National Geographic, they always had these badges like with their sort of sponsor logos or these brand names and one mm -hmm. on the hat and you know, a flag with a logo on it. So my entire proposal was, was basically revolved around trying to sell him a badge on my jacket. Yeah. And I was like, right, I'm get, we're flying out through Russia and... I'm traveling with this guy, Penn Haddo. He's massive, really experienced, fantastic. He's just a perfect person to be with. And we're gonna be walking for about eight weeks, basically over the sea. So from the north coast of Russia, you're walking over the frozen surface of the sea, pack ice, so there are no maps. It's 5.4 million square miles, which is bigger than America. So there's like giant wilderness. We're gonna be out there for two months, no one around, blah, blah, blah. And you know, for just, whatever it was, like 5,000 pounds, you can have a badge on my jacket. <laughs> and he basically said, who, who is gonna see our logo when you're in the middle of nowhere for two months? I was yeah. like, oh, that's a, yeah, that's a good point. So, <laughs> it was, so the sponsorship's been really hard. And, th and then beyond that, like it's such a, such a challenging environment. I think maybe when I was really young, I wanted to be an astronaut when I was like a kid, but I didn't, I didn't really study very hard. I haven't got a degree. So I'm nowhere near brain enough to be an astronaut and I'm probably too old now. But I, I loved, I loved, I was fascinated by that as a kid, like, and things like, I mean, I'm quite old, I'm 43 now, so I remember like the space shuttle missions going up and building the, the International Space Station, loved that. And I loved science fiction as a kid, I loved like Star Wars and stuff. <laughs> so, um, so I think for, for me, like the idea of going to Antarctica or to the North Pole, the Arctic Ocean, was, was that was probably the closest I was gonna get to like a different planet, like mm. it's a completely alien world. And it's, in a lot of ways, it is, it's, it's almost like being in space because you're in these really challenging environments. It's the coldest temperature I've ever seen is minus 48. Wow. And that's like the ambient air temperature. That's before any wind chill. So it's, 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 it's cold enough that if you, if you took your clothes off, stripped down your underwear, you'd be dead in a couple of minutes. So mm. you, you're almost like an astronaut. You've got all this protective clothing and goggles and mittens <laughs> and big boots. And, and then you've got this life support system. I'm, I'm traveling on skis, wearing a harness, dragging the sledge, which has got all my food, it's got my tent, it's got my sleeping bag, it's got all my, all my survival gear, it's got, um, it's got uh, a lot of fuel, lots of fuel, so I can, with a cooker, with a stove, I can melt snow in the tent to get water to, you know, to make food and make hot drinks. So you've got this, this like life support system in this crazy environment where like naturally humans just couldn't survive. So that's, I think that's weirdly one of the things that for me makes it satisfying is like, is like learning how to survive in those environments. But it's, it's, there's a lot to learn. So there's like the money, there's like the skills you need to develop. Um, and then there's the, the sort of human side of it, the, you know, finding the right teammates, finding support team, um, helicopter going over. <laughs> uh, and sort of figuring out like, you know, the basic stuff like teamwork and yeah. leadership and, and communication. And, and I think 
so much of that stuff I learned really early on as, as a kid you know I was yeah. I was in the scouts we'd get I remember the sort of first like first time I went hiking the first time I learned to to use a compass and a map and navigate and or to tie a knot in a bit of rope and I still on expeditions I, I still use those skills now like skills that I learned in the UK outdoors you know going camping hiking somewhere so um yeah I, I love I think ultimately I love being outside, I love wilderness, and I, I also I've realised I love extremes. Like I love I love these like massive wildernesses, but I love cities. I love I lived in London for twenty years, so I love the kind of energy of cities and the the sort of buzz and the and the you know people. So when so I know you spoke briefly there about like when you was younger and stuff and the skills that you kind of acquired. Would you say what was your first kind of experience or when you kind of noticed you really love the outdoors and nature and stuff? So what kind of sparked that within mm. you? Yeah, good question. I was in some ways I was quite lucky because we and we moved around a lot when I was a kid, but a lot of my early childhood was in the southwest UK, so it was like Devon and Somerset. So in the countryside so I was and I've got a younger brother he's three years younger than me so we were we kind of had to be mates when we were growing up because our f nearest friends were like miles away so unless you wanted to ride your bike for 45 minutes or to go and see a mate mm. it was we had to kind of get on and I think like having lived in London for 20 years I realise now that a lot of the things that I was able to do as a kid like are just impossible for most young people in London but mm. my brother and I would just spend like weekends and summer holidays at school we'd just be outside the whole time if the weather was good outside the whole time just like exploring just like doing these long walks and sort of building dens in the wood and like yeah. messing around by the river and trying to build little rafts and things and like getting in trouble all the, all the time but, um, <laughs> but we had a lot a lot of freedom and I love being outdoors um, that you know then as a kid and I think at school it's funny like I, I didn't I didn't struggle I wasn't I wasn't you know dyslexic or anything but I just wasn't motivated. I, I didn't. I was one of those young people that didn't respond well to being told to sit down, mm. like in this room, with doors and windows closed, and and twenty nine other kids, whatever it is. Uh, don't say anything mm. for an hour, and remember what you're being told. Cause it's important. <laughs> like I didn't. That didn't do it for me. I, I, I think the most important things. I. I think the way I learned growing up and probably the way I learn now is by trying things mm. and like and like doing things and, and not not being told stuff because mm. it's important that you remember this so I didn't I didn't do very well at school and to me like when I was a kid the, the exciting stuff happened outdoors I couldn't wait at the end of the school day to like get, get outside like pretty yeah um, and I think the biggest lessons I learned in the outdoors as well um, I remember doing it with the scouts we entered the scout, scout, this was in Kent, we sort of moved up to Kent at that stage, and the scout group I was in had entered this, it was a competition, it, it was called the, the Exmoor Challenge, so Exmoor's down in Devon, this big, there are two big, big national parks, Exmoor and Dartmoor, and they're both like quite challenging terrain, they're, they're quite remote and wild places and quite hilly, um, can be quite wet and boggy, um, and I, I can't quite remember, it was basically it was a long hike, but there were these teams doing it, and you had to get to these certain checkpoints and basically camp out somewhere and then finish somewhere else at the end of the next day. And um, I'd never done that before, and I remember like getting my first rucksack. I was so excited. My mum helped me like f figure out all the food and pack everything, and you know, and it was this rucksack was like bigger than me. I think it was like twelve. Was it was a massive rucksack, and I, I. Um, I really struggled. I basically had to quit in the end, and the the, the rest of the, the rest of the, I think I was the youngest in this team of I don't know, four or five or six, whatever it was. And I was the youngest and the smallest. I had this massive rucksack, and all the other kids had really cool stuff. Mm. They were like, "Oh, we've got these like ration packs that are like super lightweight, and you just add like hot water." And I had like tins of baked beans and sausages and like mm. a bag of a I had no idea what I was doing I had this like bag of apples like so heavy like everything was like because <laughs> my mum had packed it and so I was like always I was really struggling so yeah I, I remember quitting that and I felt so bad like, I just felt like I failed and mm. I was just useless and, yeah. and I often think like I wonder how much of my entire career like I can trace back to that moment this like failure this like really exciting challenge and then I couldn't couldn't do it couldn't keep up you know so it taught me a lot of lessons, um, and I think 
I, I mean, I talked already about like teamwork and, and, and leadership and communication, but I think like being outdoors with other people, all of the stuff that, that it's so easy to get, um, what's the word, like caught up in, like there's some material stuff like, oh, you know, I've got, a, I've got this phone, but I'd quite like a new phone or oh, yeah. I'd, like a, I'd like that car or oh, those clothes or those trainers or what, yeah. It kind of, it sort of, it always seems to matter less when mm -hmm. you're outdoors. And obviously you're just, you're, you're kind of immersed in like natural environment, which, which is, is so good for you. Like yeah. humans kind of, I think, need that, really benefit from that. In Japan, they have doctors in Japan um, can prescribe something to people that are ill called, it's called Shinrin Yoku, which translates as forest bathing. And it, it basically means go for a walk in the woods. Like you are, you're stressed out. Mm. You've been sat in your office for ten hours a day. Whatever, you, you're, you're completely burnt out. You're knackered. You've just been in front of a screen the whole time or indoors the whole time. It's like, leave your phone at home. Go for a walk in the woods. Like that will sort you out. So there's this. I think there's just this. This really, at a super basic level, like really beneficial. Um, side to, to, to being able to be outside in the in the fresh air and the sunshine and around plants and nature and yeah and that would probably sound a bit hippie but I, it's it's true you know I've got two two dogs at home we've got well, one was really old she's 11 she's 12 this year and she's got arthritis and we've got a puppy who's like three four months old now but the two dogs like you, you kind of I mean, the weather's really bad for a couple of days and I didn't take them out and you notice they're just like oh you know? yeah. And then you take them for a walk, and they're just like, ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. And I think humans, like we're 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 mammals, like we're animals, like we we kind of we need those. We 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 are. People say, oh, I need to spend more time in nature, but I'm always like, we, we are nature. We're yeah. animals. We're part of this whole ecosystem. You know, um, I'm waffling now, but yeah. So <laughs> I, I I learned a lot, benefited a lot, and I and I realised looking back that I was I was lucky as a kid because I had. I was able to do that. I was able to walk out the front door and go around the corner and there were some woods and I could just walk through the woods and climb trees and it was great. So. Um, what's some of the like landscapes or like kind of sceneries that mm. you kind of most remember the most or you've kind of seen? Yeah, gosh, I'm going to give you t two examples. So one, one is really extreme, one is Antarctica and I've been, um, I've been there a few times now and it's, it's just, it's a, one of the challenges with Antarctica is trying to explain to people what it's like, mm. because it's completely mind blowing. And, and, and part of it is and not just the cold and the ice and the snow, but the, but the size of it. Mm. Like Antarctica is a continent. It's the size of China and India like put together. So it's, yeah. it's nearly 10% of the Earth's surface, like 10% of the Earth is wow. Antarctica. So it's massive. Mm. And the, I read something a few years ago that the, um, and I might have got the numbers slightly wrong, but the, the amount of ice in Antarctica, like the, the amount of glacial, like freshwater ice in Antarctica, I think it's 2.6 million gigatons, or it might be 26 million gigatons, but it's, it's just an insane number. Or what, what the heck's a gigaton? So a gigaton is, is a billion wow. metric tons. So I was like, well, how can, I, how can I get my head around this number? What does that mean? So I looked up like, okay, how many, how many human beings are alive right now, roughly? I think it's like 7.8 billion, 7.9 billion. I was like, what if I divide all that ice up by how many humans? Just to get an idea, like how much, how much ice in Antarctica does every human being kind of have right now? Mm. If, you, if you split it all up, I was like, is it like a kilo of ice? Like, what's the? How much ice are we sort of all responsible for? And the answer is three million tons wow. of ice for every human, which is which I still can't, I still can't get my head around. So someone was like, oh, that's that's roughly ten aircraft carriers. Wow. So the so the size of Antarctica. And I'm like an Antarctic specialist, I know it well. Even for me, it completely blows my mind. So Antarctica is one of the most incredible places on Earth. And then the other example I'm going to give is, is much closer to home, and that is Scotland and, and the Scottish oh, Highlands. So I was, I was lucky enough, I worked up there for nearly a year when I was like 18, 19. So what, what should have been like a gap year, and I'm still on it now, I never, never made it any further, I'm still at Maine's University, maybe one day. Um, but I was lucky enough to work up there, up in the, right up in like the northwest coast of the Scottish Highlands, and it's such an amazing part of the world. Like the mm. mountains and the coastline, it's just really, really impressive. Like really wild place, and I think it's easy to 
to think, you know, if, if you're in London or even like the southeast of the UK or maybe a lot of the south of the UK full stop, to think, oh, like Britain's tiny, it's really overcrowded, mm. there's tra traffic jams everywhere, like too many people, it's all too built up, oh, where is there some, there's no, there's no open space, there's no wilderness. But you can get the train up Scotland, mm. it's, you know, and it's quite a fun journey to do. And, and if you get right up to the Highlands, it's, inc it's really remote and it's really wild. Mm. And you can go hiking in the hills for a day and not see anyone. So it's still one of my favorite places in the world. And, um, and also, I'm convinced I've been colder up there, like in January, like in a like torrential rain, like everything's wet. Colder in Scotland than I ever have in Antarctica. Wow. Like it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> that sounds crazy. Considering we should, probably, we should probably put you off the idea of going there, but it's it's it can't. I've been oh, to it's, Scotland, it's and I was conf I was actually confused how the weather was actually all right. Well, yeah, obviously yeah. I haven't seen it. Yeah, uh, I haven't you, seen the Highlands as yeah, well. So yeah. that no, I mean it can, it can be beautiful, and there are massive. Um, there's a place called Sandwood Bay, which is up right up the northwest coastline, and um, it's this. Ma I don't know how long it is. It's huge. This like sandy beach, mm. long, 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 like beautiful, like white sand. It looks like if it's like blue sky, almost looks like Caribbean. Like it's it's mm. ridiculous, but it's it's about a mile and a half, two miles away from the road, so you have to walk there. Mm. So it's always empty. Like you might meet one or two other, but it's always empty. It's a massive beach, and like on the right day, it's amazing. It's incredibly beautiful. Yeah. So there's some like mainland Britain. Yeah, you know, there are some there are some amazing, amazing, amazing places. I know you're a keynote speaker as well, mm. so I've kind of um, done a few little events and stuff and spoken. So, do you have any like tips on keynote speaking and what, some of the things that you do or what you found works for you as well? Yeah, gosh, so I, I um, I kind of fell into giving talks twenty something, twenty years ago probably, and and I, I didn't realise back then that that if if eventually you got good enough you could get paid to speak i did, i just didn't even i didn't understand that that was a thing like mm. it wasn't like oh i did my first exhibition and i thought right i can get on the speaking circuit because i didn't realize it existed mm. and also like as a teenager i was pretty shy <laughs> like if you told me i'd be you know in five ten years time be standing up on, on a stage in front of hundreds of people for an hour mm. with no notes and talking like just telling them stories I would I would have thought that sounds like my worst nightmare you know? <laughs> so so I kind of fell into it by accident really and started out talking to I, I was asked to speak to a school I remember this when I got back from that first expedition in 2001 when we didn't get to the North Pole we got like two-thirds of the way there I came back home like feeling sorry for myself and this school asked me how many would talk and I was so nervous about it that I thought right I'm going to take loads of my kit and my equipment I'm going to take my big boots and my goggles and the sledge and skis and things so I can like use them as distractions in case I forget what I'm saying or get too nervous and um, and it went really well and I, s I realized at some point during that that talk even though I hadn't made it to the North Pole I spent two months on the Arctic Ocean like camping out walking over the, the frozen surface of the sea and no one else in that great big where it was like sports hall like whole school all mm. teachers all pupils no one else had been there mm. so I think for the first time in my life I was an expert on something I was mm. like oh this is this is interesting <laughs> and then and I was like I didn't get paid for that but eventually I started getting asked to go and talk to, to businesses and companies and and, and and would get paid for it and I felt really guilty well not guilty but I felt a bit funny about it for a while because I was like I, I don't really know anything about business well I'm just this is a bit weird they're, they're like paying me all this money to come and tell stories mm. and then I heard I was on a conference call with a t TV company who wanted to do something in Antarctica two years ago. And um, one of the producers used an amazing, she just said something that blew me away on this call. And I, I just instantly like logged it in my brain and I've just been repeating it ever since. She said, humans are narrative beings. Mm. Like we're not inspired by data, mm. we're inspired by stories. And I was like, ah. Oh, Okay, right. Okay, there is maybe there is some value in what I'm doing, which is just telling stories, really. So, um, I've I've kind of learned to I, I love speaking now, love speaking to audiences, love telling stories, and and um, I think the best advice if if you want to become a a better speaker, a better storyteller, is to talk to young people, like talk to schools, because mm. they're like the most 
honest audiences. Like if they're not interested, it's obvious, you know. <laughs> and they're gonna if they can ask you questions, they will ask you the craziest questions. So like it's it's the best way to learn to become a better speaker. I think is to talk to schools. And it's also I love still love doing it now. I think it's one of the most satisfying things you can do is 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 share a story with young people that hopefully might inspire them to think a bit differently. And I said I said at the start like I, I I'm not really an explorer, but I think. I think if, if, I, if I have explored anything in 20 years, it's actually my own potential to mm. do things, to make things happen, to go from just an idea in my head to, to a thing, like, to, like zero to one, like making something happen. And my, I think looking back, like the biggest ingredient in everything I've achieved in this weird polar world that I've been working in, the biggest ingredient in that, in that success has been... Um, like the ability to, to believe in myself, that self-belief. And I, and, I, and I don't mean like sort of ego or arrogance mm. or pride, but, 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 the, but the belief in my capacity to, to do things and to create things and to, you know, um, sense of agency, I think it's called. But, um, and I, I reckon it's self-belief is a bit like a muscle. Mm. Like we're all, it's, it's a, all humans have it. Now, mm. some people naturally have more than others. Some people are just genetically stronger than others, somebody weaker. But the thing with muscles is that you can make them stronger. No matter where you're starting from, you can make it stronger. And I think the same is true with self-belief. And, and I think the, the stimulus it needs to grow is um, it's not success or failure because I've had way more failed expeditions than I've had successful ones. So it's, it's not that, but I think it's, I think it's the, the courage to, to try, mm. like to get outside your comfort zone and to attempt something. Um, and I think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking, well, I'm not going to do this thing, I'm not going to start this thing until I'm confident. Mm. But y you only, I what I'm trying to say, like, like confidence only ever follows courage. Mm. Like you can't learn to swim by reading a book about swimming. Like yeah. you've got to, you've got to do it, and you're not going to get it right the first time. It's going to be disastrous, but you've got to keep doing it to 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 learn and to build those those you know th those skills and that ability. So that it's, I think yeah, so many people are like, oh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna start, I'm not gonna try this thing until I'm confident, until I know a bit more. But like the best way to understand something is to do it, like try it, see what happens, learn from your mistakes, try again. You know, so so and I I think it's it's just like a muscle like mm. it takes muscle to do you know to lift heavy things to do like hard physical work but you can only build muscle by lifting heavy things like it's this sort of weird cycle and it's the same with self-belief like if, if you only do what's comfortable if you only do what you've always done if you only do what you what you know how to do or what you're confident that you can do then your self-belief is never challenge to grow so I think that's the I'm going off on a, going off on one again but that's 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 the story I'm trying to tell people basically heard a lot about your story in the sense of what who you are and what you get up to and give you've given me so much good advice and I'm definitely going to be taking it <laughs> away with me um I just want to say a huge thank you as well for having me um down today it's to a speak pleasure to you. thank you and I'm just so humbled by everything that you've said and just your journey and even some of the stuff I've heard today that I haven't heard before as well in that sense and I just feel so ready to go out there and do what I want to do also <laughs> like just hearing you Excellent. um and so City Girl Nature, what I've been up to and stuff, is all about trying to get young people mm. from inner cities into outdoors mm. and trying to allow them to see the benefits and stuff. And a lot of the things you said today will actually help them a lot, hugely mm. amount, because as you said multiple times as well, is that not many people know that they can do this stuff also. Exactly. Not many people yeah. know that this is something that they can get into yeah. or and also that nature is them. They mm. are nature kind of mm. thing. They are that experience and what it's all connected kind mm -hmm. of thing um, I just I feel also that um, someone like me as well mm -hmm. I you know my story in that sense as well and how we met in that mm -hmm. sense and I, I I was I was glad that I spoke before you because man I was like <laughs> that was a good I was like oh no oh god I, I talked about <laughs> how difficult you know difficult it was to drag my oh man that's a whole different level of 
challenge. So I was, I was super inspired when I heard your story. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, when I literally, <laughs> as I was explaining my story and um, like my story in a sense of where I'm coming from and stuff like that, and the fact that I only kind of got into adventure and outdoors because of circumstances, if you want to say, because I come from Lucian Borough, Deptford, where not there's not those type of opportunities exactly. out there, kind of thing, exactly. and. Yeah. I feel that like it's so important that there's other y young people that can get those opportunities. Um, I think the final question that I want to ask you is, how do you think that young people in inner cities can, can kind of get into the outdoors? And um, what yeah, would you say? Good question. I think, I think when I was starting out, like my, my first sort of expeditions, I kind of, I knew that I wanted to, to try this. I knew I knew this is something I wanted, to do, but I didn't know where to start. So I think it was like the important things early on were having the courage, was having the courage to like ask questions and find people who've done this stuff and ask their advice. And I and I always found that everyone I asked for advice was just super generous with their with their time and their wisdom. So like, don't be afraid. Like if there's somewhere something you want to do, somewhere you want to go, like who's been there already? Who can you ask for advice? Mm. And I think the other thing with with my expeditions was like finding finding the right teammates, finding someone else who wants to do what you want to do at the, you know, and having a having a kind of a partner in crime, like someone else that, that will support you, you can support them, um, who's kinda of on the same mission. So I think that's 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 important as well. And then yeah, I think just like doing a bit of research, like finding out are there Organisations you could you could do something with. Obviously, we met through British Exploring Society. Amazing, they're they're fantastic. There are other. I was I was in the Scouts as a kid. They're fantastic. There there are lots and lots of other like amazing organisations like that 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 provide these opportunities. So I think yeah, kind of do a bit of research and 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 also don't like I always worry that that my story is all about like Antarctica and the Arctic and like that's you've got to go there to have a broader adventure. But I I talk about Scotland like some of the the most amazing experiences I've had have been in Scotland, and that's a, and that's a train ride from London. Like that's mm. not that's not impossible mm. for most people, and it might, a bit like I had to figure out I didn't have any money, so I had to figure out how to how was I going to find the money to do this. Well, that's a, like that's a challenge. But like I think, I've always I, I I've come to look at challenges now as as like opportunities to grow and mm. to like challenge myself and say okay right how can I figure this out. Train Scotland, that's expensive. Okay, right. I need, I need a hundred quid for train. How am I going to find that? Okay, who could I, could, how can I, who could ask for help? Could mm. I do it for a charity? Could I do a hike? And could I raise some money that way? They just like, yeah. I think starting like is the key thing. Like having the courage to start and, and make a, make a plan. Yeah. Um, I hope that's helpful. I'm trying to think what else. And also, obviously, my, I'm like an extreme example, but with. With almost all of my expeditions, so many people around me were at some point were like, "Nah, it's not going to happen. That's impossible. Mm. No, it's not. It's too, yeah, too, too, you're not going to do. You can't do that. It's too much money. Too difficult. Too challenging. Whatever." So I've always been surrounded, not surrounded by, but they've they've always always been these like doubting voices around mm. me, and often it's people closest to you. Often it's your family and your friends. Mm. Like, nah, you, this this is too. This is too. You're not going to do this one. Mm. So I think. One of the lessons for me is that if you're trying to do something that people like you don't normally do, you're going to get a lot of doubts. There's going to mm -hmm. be a lot of negativity. And I think the lesson for me is that the, the word impossible is, is almost always just someone else's opinion. Like r Very rarely is it the truth. So don't, don't pay too much attention to like the, the doubting negative voices. Like there's always, there's always a way. <laughs> it's nice that you say the impossible thing because even that word it says I'm possible exactly, so, exactly. <laughs> literally exactly. I love that you've said that as well <laughs> so well thank you again and Pleasure. I'm I'm so amazed and about you I honestly like you're someone that I kind of look up to as well especially for my journey and just meeting you so early on as well mm -hmm. And you just kind of border my horizon onto my own journey and where I'm trying to get to as well. Thank you. So thank you so well, much. It goes well. both ways. Like you've genuinely inspired me as well. So it's a pleasure, pleasure getting to know you. So thank you. Thank you.